All right, all right. Come on down and have a seat in front. This can be casual, and I know people will be coming and going. Come on up. All right, we're going to get started. As you, we have a lot, we have a mixed audience here tonight. There are a, we're probably leveraged a little more on the Wolverine side. So for those of you who are Michigan fans, let us know you're here. Woohoo! All right. Uh, we also have, we invited Airbnb employees to come on down and learn from uh, the discussion today. So thanks for being here. I'm Andrea Robb. I have worked at Airbnb for about three years. I come to you today in two capacities. Um, I recently joined as a board member on the University of Michigan Alumni Association, um, which is Go Blue, which has been a lot of fun. And in my uh, work there and the volunteer work, I've been able to get to know some of the people on campus and be reconnected with all that's going on in Ann Arbor. So today we're bringing two deans out to meet with you. Um, so I am in the talent design space. Kate Shaw and I both work together very closely. Kate is gonna be our moderator tonight. Uh, she is the director of learning, I'm the director of talent design, and we are thinking about these topics a lot and trying to figure out how to apply them to the workspace, which is the future of work, future of leadership, and how we can be thinking about the ever-changing space of work in a fast-growing economy, a changing workplace. Um, but before I share bios of our guests today, I just want to invite Kate, Dean Finhol, and Dean Daru to come on up stage, and I'll share a little bit more about our deans and what they're going to share today. All right, all right, welcome. So Scott is on my side of the panel, and he gave me permission to call him Scott, and we've got Tom here. So these are two deans visiting us from Ann Arbor. So Dean Scott Daru, he has a background in private equity, management consulting, and academia. He, was the, he is the Edward J. Fry Dean of the Stephen M. Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. And he's a widely published thought leader in business education and action-based learning, as well as an award-winning researcher and instructor. He believes that business is the most powerful force for economic and social impact, and it is the responsibility of Michigan Ross to develop the next generation of business leaders. Dean Daru joined Michigan Ross in 2007. So welcome. And yes. And Dean Finhol, you come to us as the Dean of the School of Information, which for those of you who don't know, is where computer science also sits. From 1997, is that right? Sort of. Well, he's gonna take it from there. Uh, Dean Finhol taught in psychology and information and was co-founder and then director of Collaboratory for Research on Electronic Work which pioneered the study of human-computer interaction in organizational settings, including research on many applications that are now commonplace, such as video conference and shared document editing. In 2009, Dean, Dean Finholt was appointed as a professor of the School of Information, and he was appointed dean in April of 2016. So welcome to San Francisco. Welcome to the Airbnb stage. Kate, take it away. Thanks everybody for coming. So just to clue you in a little bit to format, my hope is to um, ask our guests some questions, but I'd very much like to open the floor to all of you so that we make sure that we answer questions that are top of mind for you as well. So um, I'm gonna spend about the next 30 minutes or so getting into conversation with these two on stage and sort of laying the foundation for the discussion today. And then I would love to open it to the audience for questions for the last 20 minutes or so of this evening. Does that sound fair? So as we're going, think of things that, that might be top of mind for you. Um, I'd love after Andrea's intro to sort of flesh out a little bit more the work that both of you are doing. And, and Tom, I'd love to start with you. Um, you have a PhD in social and decision sciences from Carnegie Mellon. Um, and your online profile mentions that your current research focuses on the energy costs of forming and maintaining social ties, computational mediation of trust in virtual organizations, and the use of ultra-resolution collaboration environments. 
Does everyone know what all those things are? Okay, so, so given that, <laughs> I'm good, I'm glad because I, I didn't really understand all of it either. So I'm wondering if you can flesh that out for us and explain a little bit about sort of what your main areas of research have been and, and sort of how you understand those areas of, of research to tie into the topic today, which is really all about the future of work and how it might impact all of us here today. Right, so one of the things I've been concerned about through my career is how uh, people at a distance can cooperate and collaborate with one another, which is certainly an interest for a firm like uh, Airbnb, but also for the University of Michigan. Even within the Ann Arbor campus, we have this problem spanning uh, distances of even four or five kilometers. So, um, so that's been an overriding concern, and uh, how people gain a sense of uh, fellow feeling and, uh, and, and shared team spirit when they are in dramatically different uh, cultural or national settings has been a, has been a recurring, recurring concern. And I think you know, the future of work is we will be working with people who are different than we are, who have different experiences than we have, and we need to be able to quickly develop a rapport with them and understand their particular uh, cultural orientation and, and sensitivity, and, and not just assume that everyone thinks the way you know, Wolverines do. Um, and Scott, as an expert in leadership and team and organizational development, you've written about a number of topics, including the evolu evolution of leadership in times of turbulence, self-managing teams, power and self-interested behavior, learning agility. What are you most interested in tackling next? Uh, one of the things that I'm, I think, most fascinated now is just the level of dynamism that organizations are facing. Uh, the world around us is changing so rapidly uh, on a global scale with uh, advances in technology and, and so forth, is how do uh, the organizations um, uh, adapt how they think about talent? Uh, I'm really passionate about understanding how you develop uh, and retain talent. Uh, how do you enable uh, the people that are working in an organization like Airbnb uh, to grow, to learn, to develop, uh, because the expertise they had yesterday will not necessarily be the expertise they need in the future. And so how do we as organizations create uh, that platform for growth uh, is something that I'm really passionate about. Uh, and I see we, what we do at the University of Michigan is create, uh, in some sense, the mindset and the tools that uh, give our students and thus our alumni uh, the platform uh, to continue growing, learning, and developing throughout their careers, not only to add value in the businesses or the organizations they work in, but to have this uh, sort of sustained adaptive uh, ability um, to continue to learn and grow. And so how do we organize to do that, whether we're an educational institution uh, or a business like Airbnb? So, so to segue a little bit into the future of work, um, there's, it's obviously been a very hot topic over the last several years, and, and the sort of the prevailing nature of the discussion is that there are these several forces that are all colliding all at once to build a different future than what we've experienced in the past, and that those, those forces are primarily one of technology, first and foremost, that technology is drastically changing our world. Um, the demographics are changing drastically, right? We've got um, people are living longer, but we are also seeing increased diversity in organizations, um, whether those organizations are global or not global. The fact of the matter is that the face of the employees is now um, changing. And then, of course, there's the globalization of talent markets where someone sitting in San Francisco is now suddenly competing for the same kind of work as someone might be, might be looking to do in any other part of the world. Do you agree that these are the three primary factors that are sort of changing the way that we work? And if so, how do you understand those factors and the way that even those factors are evolving over time? So, you know, we have the concern at the University of Michigan about identifying talent, of course, and we've thought a lot about uh, how technology changes that, uh, that process. And it's been one of the drivers in my school for us to invest and explore more in uh, online education. So um, we've been running uh, a couple of MOOC specializations that have been very successful over the last few years. One of the things that allows us to do is uh, expose our, our brand and our identity to a global audience that we were previously unable to reach. So 80% of the students who take uh, School of Information MOOCs are outside the United States uh, in places that they will, they will never visit Ann Arbor, they will never come to the big house, they will never do many of the things that we associate with being Michigan students, but nonetheless, they will be Michigan students. And um, 
we're very excited about the potential of this global catchment for identifying people who who have you know who have stepped forward through their own curiosity and interest to identify as uh, talented individuals who are now worthy of uh, of attention and and, and focus. So. Um, we're, we're very excited about that. It's something that we're uh, pushing forward with uh, pretty aggressively. I, I think that's actually a wonderful example of the mega trends that you're referring to. Uh, if you just think about that example, you've got globalization and technology coming together uh, to create new opportunities for education, where we're reaching people that we never could reach before. Uh, and I mean, we were in the same boat. So on the flight over uh, today, uh, this morning, I was having a conversation via LinkedIn on the flight with a student from Greece who's in our MOOC about what she is learning and how it applies to her organization. I would have never reached that student uh, in the past. Uh, so to me, that's really exciting. Uh, I was trying to think as you were asking your question, are there other mega trends there that I think are reshaping the future of work, if you will? And, and if I was forced to add one, one that I would add uh, is really what our society is expecting of the organizations within which we work. Uh, so if you think about Airbnb, for example, uh, a, core component, a core component of the mission, the purpose, as I understand it, is a notion of belonging. Uh, how many organizations out there as part of their core mission have belonging as a, as a part of that, right? That's, that's something that is relatively novel. Uh, and one of the things I think is changing is our perspective on the role that organizations, businesses play in society. It's one of the reasons that uh, about 18 months ago, uh, we stood up an initiative um, that is really at the intersection of business and the impact that business has in society. Whether that's economic, uh, job opportunities, value creation in economic forms, whether it's social, uh, social mobility, social change. Um, that role that business can play in society, we're not only developing students who have a certain set of skills or a certain expertise, whether it be in computer science or finance, marketing, whatever it might be, but also with a deeper perspective, I think, on the role that their organizations are going to play in, so so in society and not only consider, say, the shareholders of the firm and how do we maximize profit, but how do we run a financially sustainable business that has a positive impact economically and socially in the communities within which we operate? And for me, that's really inspiring. I think that's another mega trend that is reshaping the world of work in ways that a decade, 20 years ago, was not as prevalent as it is today. So maybe we can talk for a moment then about this sort of changing social contract between employers and employees, right? There's now far more independent workers than there ever were before, far more members of the gig, gig, sorry, the gig economy than there ever were before. Um, and yet at the same time, you sort of speak to this sort of changing value proposition that employers need to keep up with in terms of what it is they're offering to their employees, how they provide them with opportunities for growth, et cetera. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you see the landscape changing between employers and employees, or even employers and their contractors. Yeah, so, um... He has a faculty member in his school, Jerry Davis, who is fond of pointing out that uh, we're actually better off when more of us are employed by very large organizations than if we're all engaged in sort of gig economy type deals or where we are free agents and contracting with firms and so forth because the large firm has the capacity to provide quite a generous safety net for, for its employees. And to me, the challenge is how do we how do we achieve that without some of the liabilities of those large firms, which is the, you know, the kind of the conservatism, the uh, risk aversion, the um, minding the status quo and so forth, plus hierarchy and many of the other kind of, you know, evils of the organization person, if you will. So, so to me, that's the, that's the sweet spot is achieving uh, fulfilling work, you know, uh, satisfying this part of Maslow's hierarchy, um, and then also this part up here. And, uh, you know, I don't think we've found that, that answer yet, but uh, it's, I don't think it's purely to say that we were all free agents and we're all negotiating with um, holding companies uh, and, and so forth. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, think about it this way. What are the uh, services and the infrastructure uh, assets that large organizations provide? Something as simple as healthcare. 
right? If you become a free agent uh, working in the gig economy, where do you get your health care from? Uh, from a learning uh, perspective, uh, who's investing in you? I think one of the biggest challenges that tech companies have today is the rate of turnover. Um, because learning organizations are going to wake up and, and, and ask the question, who do we invest in and why if in 12 months they're gone? Right? And so you're actually training that person for the next organization that they're working in and so on. Uh, and that labor market's not unique to the Valley. That labor market's not unique to the US. Uh, China was complaining a decade ago about the, uh, the fluidity of their labor market and how firms essentially pulled back on investing in em employees because they weren't going to stay. Uh, and so if we are going to shift to this world that is much more gig-like, uh, short-term work, um, free agent nation, which I think that book was written in the 90s, if I remember correctly. Um, if, we're, if we really are going to do that, I think there's actually an opportunity for new businesses to come up, which is how do you organize to provide those services? Uh, I mean, if you think about small businesses forming co-ops so that they can uh, purchase supplies in larger volumes to get better prices, same idea. Uh, just now applied to other uh, organizational forms and the, and the infrastructure that large organizations would provide historically. So I think there's actually a lot of opportunity with that, but if we don't figure it out, it's going to be hard to sustain. What, what have you found? I'm curious around just the relationships, particularly in remote collaboration, um, just how that's changing over time as people come and go more quickly or as teams form internationally. What are you seeing in terms of the overall trends or trajectories with respect to teaming, collaborating, and particularly collaborating across cultures? So, um, so you know, I've been a proponent of remote collaboration my entire career, but the thing that I keep coming back to is the significance of breaking bread together, is that in all of these cases, we find uh, the most successful distributed teams are the ones that occasionally have co-location. So they, uh, they, they're, you know, in the case of uh, grantees on NSF awards, they come together at all hands meetings. Um, you have retreats or other kinds of convocations where you, you reaffirm what your values are and, you know, you, you have shared experiences. I don't think we've found a way yet through, um, through these mediated mechanisms to replace the, you know, the kind of esprit you generate through, uh, through watching a game together or going on a camping trip together or, or, or whatever. And so that, you know, I, I think it's often difficult for people to understand that you can, you can dematerialize some of this stuff through, you know, video conferencing and whatnot, but we have evolved as a species to orient to one another, to read facial and, and cues and body language and to, um, to to convene with one another, and we can't ignore that, even though we're racing into this future where we can uh, carry on conversations with people on our transcontinental flight. I mean, it's it's interesting. I was uh, I was having a conversation with some of our students uh, a couple of weeks ago who are part of this new program in the business school, where we're actually bringing students from all across campus, uh, social work, uh, school of information, engineering, etc. We're actually building businesses uh, in the school in partnership with other companies. So like Shinola, for example, their headphone business, we're helping them run that business as part of the curriculum now. And it's fascinating. So I had a student who is much more advanced in technology than I could ever dream of being. And she came in and she was, um, I was asking her, okay, so how is it working with the employees at Shinola, your team who's across campus and so forth? And she was essentially lamenting about uh, the lack of effective communication because they couldn't get together. And that evolved into this really fascinating conversation about the use of technology and some of its limitations in creating relationships. Uh, and especially when you don't have this long-lasting relationship, how do you communicate effectively? And so I think her, her experience would reinforce uh, what Tom is referring to. And the data is really clear on that. Uh, and so how are, how are organizations going to evolve to enable these cross-functional, cross-geography, cross-lines of business teams to come together? We always talk about how creativity is enhanced when we have people from different backgrounds, different experiences, different parts of organizations working together. And then we elevate the value of technology because technology allows us to connect in ways that we've never been able to do before. 
But at the same time, we also understand the limitations of that in creating relationships that enable that creativity to come to life. And I don't think organizations have, uh, have figured that out exactly as to how to make that work. And whether you're in education or an Airbnb, um, I think that's something that we're all still evolving to. When you look out at your students and you follow their trajectories, they get older, and as you sort of watch the long-term impact of the future of work as, sort of as it plays out, I'm curious, you know, clearly we are very quickly developing technologies um, and impacting the world, us around, the world around us through those technologies, and I'm wondering how you're seeing those technologies then in turn impact us. So for people who are entering your school today, I'm curious, whether their facility with these tools has changed or is any different from, from the facility that you would have developed in and people in the generation before them, for example? Well, so the historic roots of, of our school are the, are the library tradition. So we were 70 or 90 years ago the School of Library Science. And it's interesting when you talk with um, librarians, I was in a, a conference in Sheffield last week and there was a a colleague of mine from the OCLC, which is the, they're the online catalog people down in uh, Dublin, Ohio. And she was presenting data on how undergraduates search for information. And the, the impression you have is that students entering university today are, you know, they're the digital generation, they're very sophisticated and so forth. Actually, they're not. So what they are, are um, they're, they're specifically skilled in certain kinds of aspects of use of the technology. But when it comes to appreciating which is a credible source, for example, in Google or in, a, in, a, in the Google return, they were saying things like, well, the first one back is the most credible. And, you know, <laughs> we're in trouble. We're, we're in trouble if that's the future. Sorry, sorry but Google people. Which, but. which was Wikipedia, by the way. <laughs> so, I, you know, so I think that's an interesting example of, um, of the old being new again, is that there are some set of skills uh, related to to critical thinking that, that we need to, to cultivate and return to, that those don't change in the face of evolving technologies. And, and we can't, you know, in the, in the rush to understand these things, we can't lose sight of the importance of that, which I think is, is something we stand for at, at the University of Michigan. I, I concur uh, 100%. And the ex types of experiences that we're trying to create at the university, whether it's information, business, engineering, LSNA, and others, is, I think one of the most important things we can do as a university is uh, help our students understand how to thrive in the context of ambiguity. So for example, if I go search for something in Google and I come to believe that the first return is the most valid, reliable uh, set of information, uh, that's not me being effective in the context of ambiguity. Uh, I need to be able to consume that information, think critically about it, understand its source, understand its pros and cons, et cetera, and being able to really uh, think critically and analytically about that information and how that's informing the decision we're trying to make. Uh, and so if we get a, a 17, 18 year old student who is thinking like that, or a 28 to 30 year old student who is thinking like that, uh, I see it as our obligation to society. And I genuinely believe that our obligation and responsibility to society to help them become critical, analytical uh, thinkers where they're processing information uh, in a much richer way, uh, whether they're making business decisions or uh, you know, policy decisions or whatever the case may be. Um, and, uh, and one of the reasons that I, I, I really believe in what we're doing as a university is no matter what discipline, what, what vertical area of expertise you're talking about on campus, we're all focusing on these horizontal skills of critical analytical thinking and then the social skills of how do you work together to be able to uh, generate uh, the most value out of that diverse group. That's a common thread that cuts across regardless of what vertical you're talking about. So to expand on that a bit, I mean, the, the expectation is that the more jobs become automated, the more important basic human skills will become, whether it's ingenuity, curiosity, imagination, empathy, social, emotional intelligence. Um, it sounds to me like, well, I guess the question is, do you agree, A, and B, what does that mean for those verticals, the future of those verticals that you're teaching today that are presumably driving some deep expertise in some subject matter? I don't think the requirement for the expertise goes away. In, in fact, the description you've just given is that that, re that requirement will become more intense over time. But I also think that, um, that you need to develop 
uh, students who have compassion, who have the ability to, to place themselves in someone else's shoes, understand where they're coming from, and, and to be able to do that very, very quickly, much faster and more adept in a more adept fashion than is possible right now. And we probably underplay that in the, in the curriculum. So um, as an example, uh, in my master's programs at the School of Information, over half of the students come from outside the United States. And I look at that and I say, that is an outstanding opportunity for our US-born students to start practicing as graduate students the kind of experiences they're going to be living with every day. But their attitude instead is that they've been saddled with people who are perhaps not as facile in English as they are, who aren't as adept at expressing themselves in, in writing. Um, you know, so, it's, so they tend to see it as a half empty rather than a half full proposition. And that's probably what we have to do more. We have to do more education to, to get people over that. I mean, it's, I mean, it's interesting. As, as, a, as a business school, so I get this question. So if you take our undergraduate program, uh, the schools that we would compete for talent with in our undergraduate business program, many of them are four-year business programs. And so you come in and almost immediately you're studying finance, marketing, et cetera. And though we are freshmen enrolling, uh, we, uh, our uh, undergraduate freshmen spend 99% of their freshman year not in the business school and a significant portion of their sophomore year and a notable portion of their junior and senior. The question is, is why? And we believe uh, at our core that, for example, if I have a student that later in his or her career is making a really important decision for their business that is going to impact more than just their business, the community within which they exist, the web of relationships that that company has, I want them to understand history because chances are that same decision has been made at some point in human history. And I would like them to understand the historical context within which they're making that decision, or the cultural social context within which they're making these decisions. And it's that liberal arts holistic education that's critically important for that. And so though we are teaching the vertical of business, if you will, and there are certainly verticals within that, it's critically important that we're developing those, what I would call horizontals, uh, so that we're developing really well-rounded leaders for that next generation because the world of work, it comes right back to the future of work. The world of work is going to require that more and more uh, because of what technology is enabling, because of what globalization and the borders that are being broken down despite the political rhetoric that we hear every day, uh, that ship sailed. Uh, and so we live in a global world uh, and that's to our betterment. Uh, and it's how we embrace that and how we educate people to thrive in it is what we're after. So one, one of the, you, you mentioned the future, the expertise will be as important, you know, tomorrow as it is today, if not more so. And, and I wonder if we can debate that just for a moment, because I think one of the things we struggle with oftentimes is given that information is so easily discoverable, whether or not it's true, is, is I guess the other question. But what is this place of expertise in today's organization? And given the fact that we are all having to adapt and readapt and readapt and reinvent and reinvent, how long might any one of us expect to hold on to any expertise? What is it, what, and, and does expertise essentially have a shelf life? So, so I'm reminded of um, a story from, uh, from the Digital Equipment Corporation, where when they first started developing the technology for tech editing, which, which when, you, when you put the VAX together, which was you know, the, the, their famous mini computer, you, it, your customer would buy it in different configurations. And those configurations were edited by humans. And the, the company decided it would be much more efficient to uh, produce a, an AI version of that. And the way they approached it was to ask the existing tech editors to tell them how they did their work, which they did for about two weeks before they figured out what was really going on. And then they completely withheld all information because they could see that that was gonna that was gonna replace their job. So it's it, you know when I when I say that I think expertise will always be there. Maybe the refinement of that is to say that I think judgment will always be there. I think there's always going to be a place for humans in the loop to to decide. We we could do this algorithmically. We could develop a mechanism that uh, drives attention to the very maximum, so that we then create vulnerabilities to all kinds of 
horrible secondary effects. But you would hope then that you have people sitting around the room who maybe took that ethics course in LSA um, and raise their hand and say, but would that be the would that be the morally correct thing for us to do? And then and then back away from it. And um, you know, but one of my fears is that as you go to an increasingly algorithmically driven economy, it moves so fast that you don't have those timeouts to, to sit back and reflect on what the, you know, what some of these secondary consequences might be. I think, I think the answer to your question, and I think uh, Tom's um, uh, story illustrates this, is it depends on how you define expertise. So if what we're talking about when we say expertise um, is knowing, um, you know, a particular what, right, in the sense of I know how this computer chip works, right? Well, chances are the technology that is on that chip is going to evolve in the next decade where whatever's on that chip is not going to be the same technology a decade from now. So if that's the expertise you're talking about, yes, it has a shelf life and it's probably much shorter than even any of us even realize. If the expertise you're talking about is judgment, or wisdom of how do I process information and give that some context and make decisions inside of it, that does not have a shelf life. Um, in, in fact, it's, I think, increasingly important to, over time, given the world that we're going into. A lot of the horizontal skills we're talking about in terms of the social skills, uh, the interpersonal skills, the cultural skills, the, in, the cultural intelligence, the world we live in, that is at a premium. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's going away. Uh, and the one that I would add to that, that we haven't talked as much about, is the ability that I have to learn and adapt over the course of a very long career. So I'll give you an example. So I have a faculty member who is retiring this year. Uh, and when he got his PhD, computers in the way that we know them did not exist. Okay. Yet, he today is one of the more successful venture capitalists in the Midwest of the United States and is investing heavily and has invested heavily in technology companies that we would all look up to. Okay? So he has had to reinvent himself many times over. That is expertise. How do you do that in a way where you can reinvent yourself, learn, adapt, rinse, and repeat? That is an, a form of expertise uh, that I don't believe we as uh, educational institutions, speaking broadly, uh, or organizations uh, have paid enough attention to. Well, maybe we can then segue into the sort of last chapter of this discussion, and then I would love to open it up for questions, which is really about what is the future then of learning, right? Because it used to be that we would learn, and then we would work, and then we would retire, and we would you know, go enjoy our lawns and water them, and, you know, and now all those things have become blended, right? We were living, we're working, we're, we're, we have our leisure experiences, but all of this is all rolled up in, in, um, together. Um, and yet what you pointed out, particularly with the story around this person, is that he had to learn and learn again and learn again and learn again and essentially, un essentially unlearn what he had learned in order to take on new practices. So your job then as a university is not just to educate as a one and done, but really to set up a lifetime of learning. So. How do you do that? Like, what does that actually end up looking like at the University of Michigan today? How do you create experiences that, 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 that your students can then essentially go and self-replicate so that they can continue to drive their learning over time? Yeah, so, so for me, it is uh, creating within the alumni student body, if you will, the capacity to organize their own learning activities. And, um, and we as a university may need to be more adept at providing the scaffolding for that, but my, my, my assumption is they have many better ideas about what they want to do than, than say we would or a committee of our faculty would if they sat around a room and, and thought about it. And then bring our faculty in as experts or consultants or advisors along the side uh, and that that process should be happening over the entire lifespan. So, you know, so much of university education is focused on uh, taking 18 year olds and graduating them at 21 and then launch and forget. And I don't, I don't think that's probably a successful model for the future and I don't think that's going to be one that endears us to, to our alumni. We need to keep producing value over this, the span of their career, over the span of their lives. And I think the way we do that is by finding those 
networks of affinity within our alumni base that have shared interests and then give them the means to tap into the capacity of, of the University of Michigan's educational resources to, in, to enable their kind of self-directed learning as opposed to you know, organizing watch parties or whatever. Or, or we can do watch parties like this one, this is awesome. Nothing wrong with watch parties, but, but we want to also use that, that, that same mechanism to unleash people's other creative energies. And you know, if your thing is, I, I don't know, uh, you want to understand network science more, and we can enable that within the context of our, how many living alumni are there? 580,000. Our 580,000 living alumni, that we should, we should be able to do that. And I think that's a, a noble aspiration for the university. We, we don't currently have the capacity to do that. And so I think all of that's exactly correct. And I'll give you examples of things that I'm thinking about and uh, keep me up at night, not because I'm worried, but because I'm excited. So the CEO of Coursera is in the room this evening. And um, uh, imagine what they, they are today. So I think there's a roughly 30 million, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, users on the platform. I think there's a goal to have 300 million at some point in the future. So imagine what that is. Now imagine that that becomes like uh, what Amazon is for your shopping experience. So when you create a profile on Amazon, based on what you put in, they probably know, I'm making it up, 50% of everything they need to know to personalize a shopping experience for you. And then about after the third purchase, they know about 80% of everything they need to know to personalize a shopping experience for you. Or Netflix with your entertainment consumption, right? Unless you're my wife and I who has share an account and confuse it completely, <laughs> right? Based on what you watch, it is customizing and personalizing not based on what you tell it, but based on all of the other people that are on it and what they're watching with patterns, right? Why can't learning do the exact same thing? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that Coursera and other platforms like that are going to create something similar as a way to customize and personalize the learning journey that you're on. And why does it start when you're 17 or 18 for college? Right, so depending on the subject, depending on the person, you might be ready for that at age 12, right? So I think that mass personalization uh, educational experience and learning experience, that is going to be a wave, uh, a, sea sh a sea change, if you will, in higher education that I, I think is right there. Um, universities themselves. Uh, universities, we just celebrated our 200th birthday. Uh, as a university. We did something right because we lasted 200 years. In my view, we've been a content organization for a really long time. You paid a tuition to come access content. Uh, and I think we increasingly have to shift from a content organization to an experience organization because any sector that has traded on content has been disrupted by technology in significant ways, music, publishing, et cetera. And so the experience becomes the premium in ways that we can offer. Open loop universities, where why is, you, why is the university experience a transaction? Why is it that you show up and you pay tuition for one year, two years, three years, or four years, depending on your degree, and then you graduate, and then you're gone and, and welcome to the world? Your learning didn't start when you came, and it certainly didn't end when you left. So why can't we be more of an open loop university where you're coming as you need? Uh, for these new experiences. Why is your tuition a tuition? Why is it not a subscription? Right? These are all the types of things that I think are going to revolutionize higher education, but really reshape what learning looks like for kids, adults, all the way through our lifetime. That's great. Um, I'm curious if anyone in our audience has a question. If not, I've got a whole lot more, but oh, thankfully we see one. Okay, hi. Um, do we have an audio a mic out in the? Andrea's got a mic for you, so we can all hear you. Thank you. This so actually this touches on a lot of what you just said, uh, Dean Debrew. But this uh, question is primarily for Dean Finholt. So I recently took a, a Coursera course by Professor Charles Severance. Great course. Dr. Chuck rules. <laughs> and I was just thinking. I mean, you talked about the benefits of online education and. Do you view it as potentially competitive in the near term or medium term where students will actually say, hey, I'm just going to learn through Coursera or uh, some other online option versus actually going to a university? 
Right. So, so we grapple with that all the time. And I would say, you know, maybe four years ago, there was more anxiety and paranoia about it than there, than there is now. I, I guess for, for me, I remain confident that there are aspects of the residential experience that will re retain value. And, and there's some of the things that we've been talking about up here. It's the, you know, the identifying of the kindred spirit, the, you know, the lecture or the conversation at two in the morning about content that you have sophomore year, whatever, the requisite 2 a.m. conversation sophomore year. Um, I'm not sure that, that the online experience is ready to, to replicate that. And um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it will never be there. I don't think it's ready right now to do that. So, it, so I think the, the, the burden is on places like the University of Michigan to keep generating value for the residential experience. And what's clear to me is that um, we will not be able to do that if our orientation is to continue to put a professor at the front of a big room and, and throw the slides up on the overhead projector, which is a, now a s almost 60-year-old technology, and expect that, that, that people will readily pay top dollar for that experience, if you will, when they can pretty much get the same thing online. So, so we have, you know, the, the game is on for us. It, and will we be able to adapt is the, is the question. And you, you know, we, we've looked at the, the online experiences as, as a way of challenging our thinking about the residential experience. And, you know, and part of that is, uh, is realizing the uniqueness of the residential experience, which is, I think, some of the kind of apprentice style learning, the experiential learning, and so forth. I don't, I don't preclude that in the online setting. I think things like augmented reality, for example, could be a, a mechanism for delivering experiential learning at scale to, to a very broad audience. We're not quite there yet, but, um, but I, think the, I think that's where the, the game is for us. Hi, um, thank you so much again for coming um, all the way to the Bay Area. I have a question for Dean Deru. Um, we, you talked about how social impact is something that companies to consider because that's part of kind of like the future of work, right? But currently, sometimes we talk to business folks and still at the their goal is execution and sales and revenue for stakeholders, right, or shareholders. Um, and then you can, there's discussions about, like, for example, Uber versus Lyft. Yeah, Lyft might have, or one of them might have a uh, more, you know, nice social impact. By the end of the day, like, which one comes to me faster? And that's the one I want to use, right? So how, how would you discuss or how would you argue the idea of the value behind social impact? I would love to know your perspective on that. Yeah, so uh, shareholders matter. Right? I mean, they own the company, and your company has to be financially sustainable. Right? Uh, and whether you're private or public, that is true. But let's take your example of Uber and Lyft. Right? So Uber got into quite a bit of uh, trouble uh, given business practices where essentially, so who's, who's the most important, uh, I'll give you, who are the mo two most important groups in the Uber business model? Groups of people. Drivers and riders. Okay, riders pay, right, and drivers drive. So if you're Uber and you want to maximize profits, in particular if you're trying to go public to convince your shareholders to pay a higher price, who do you take more from? You got two choices. You can charge higher rates to your riders, which is then going to push them to lift for a lower price, right, or you can take more from your drivers. Which route did Uber take? Drivers, right? And then Uber felt the backlash of that. So if you take such a short-term perspective on how you treat the people that make up your organization, even if you don't consider them employees, right? Even if I only cared about shareholders, that's a bad business decision. Even if I only cared about shareholders, that's a bad business decision, right? And so that's why I'm saying when you're making decisions, you have to have a, a broad, an appreciation for the broader context within which you're making those decisions. Even if your, your goal is not to save the world, your goal is to get a person from point A to point B. 
But in order to do that effectively in a sustainable way, you actually have to understand all the stakeholders that you're impacting, your community, in this case, your drivers, your riders, and so on. I think it's very easy for us to sit on the sidelines and say companies only care about profits. When you talk to CEOs who really understand, I think it's actually the majority of them, um, and yes, we can find the, uh, the, the cases of the greedy and all of that. I, I totally get that. But when you look across, you know, you'll hear language like the enlightened shareholder model, even if you don't believe in the stakeholder model of communities, employees, and so on. Even if you only care about your shareholders, as long as you think about the long-term horizon, Airbnb, for example, talks about the infinite horizon of the organization. Right? Not what the vision is for the 10-year, but infinite horizon. If you only cared about shareholders and you care about the long term, you can't make those trade-offs. Where businesses get in trouble is, in, a, in particular, public companies, is trying to meet quarterly numbers. And that's where you get in trouble, where you start making trade-offs that are actually not in the long-term best interest of the firm. So I'm happy to talk about it more. But it's something I feel very passionate about, um, that we're doing everything we can to develop the next generation of business leaders who have that broader perspective. You don't have to work in a nonprofit to have an impact in the world. In fact, I would argue that going to some of these large enterprises, if you want to uh, rid the ocean of plastics, then go to the large supply chains in the world, like Walmart and others, and change that. And, and that gives you a platform for impact that is, that is nothing short of remarkable. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Hey, thanks. I uh, just want to ask a follow-up on that specific point about like um, organizations taking a longer view. And I respect your opinion, and I just counter it, because that's not the experience I have. I just see overwhelmingly organizations really, really focus on those quarterly numbers like you're talking about. And I have a suspicion, I wish I had evidence to prove it, that this drive towards the gig economy and people leaving in droves, right? This is like something we're all concerned about in San Francisco. Everyone's leaving, it's too expensive here, is also a function of the lack of purpose and value. So uh, Daniel Pink's drive, mastery, autonomy, purpose, like, I really see a lack of that, and um, I think the question, if I could reframe it, is really about, like, not just from the perspective of a business school student, how do we inspire them, but even as employees, how do you see ways for us to continue to inspire and motivate the organizations that we're a part of so that we don't lose that sense of drive and purpose and social mission, which I know university is so well known for? I think your, your question is spot on, and I actually, you and I would agree more than we would disagree. We actually had Dan, Dan's a friend, we actually had Dan on campus not that long ago uh, to talk with our students about drive and purpose. Uh, and uh, there are two things I would say to that. So one is we all have free will, right? And so if you're in an organization that is devoid of a sense of purpose and mission, you have free will. Right? Because there are organizations out there that do. Okay? Um, second is, I think um, uh, many executives uh, are finding it really difficult for themselves to even define what that purpose is. Right? So many of the very senior executives that I have the privilege of working with, when you ask them, what is the purpose of the organization, and you ask why about three to five times, it's really hard to answer for many people, right? Which is exactly why what we are doing in trying to help our students understand uh, how to connect with a sense of purpose and build that purpose into the organizations that we're founding, that we're working in, and so on, is so critically important. So to answer your question specifically, what can you do as an employee? You can demand that sense of purpose. Where is it? Right? And if it's not there, you have free will. That, I mean, that would be how I would think of it. Um, so I think as a, I think Andrea was going to come on and close and sort of tell us about um, what we might expect next. But I'm wondering, well, while she's um, making her way towards the front, 
given the future of work, given, given the skills that you find are going to be most relevant, looking into the future of work, even in the next five years, what parting words of advice do you have for people in the audience who are, who, all of us who are striving to maintain relevance in, in, as that change unfolds? Um, well, t to me, it's uh, openness to experience. And, um, and I think that for, for a lot of us, that begins by uh, voluntarily putting ourselves into uh, positions of risk or vulnerability. And to me, nothing does that more than travel. So go, going to places that you've never been to before, meeting people that you don't encounter on a daily basis, I, I think that's kind of the, the bedrock of understanding that, how to be open to, to other people and their beliefs. So that would be my parting sense. You're not just saying that because you're at Airbnb. Is this just I'm lucky? totally not you just, just saying lucky. that because I'm at Airbnb. But, you know, if you want to put that up on your wall out there, that, that would be okay. fine. Perfect. I won't charge you. With, with Tom Finholt. Yeah. Right. Um, so I would concur. Uh, we actually had, we had Malcolm Gladwell on campus not that long ago, um, or last fall, and, um, or two falls ago. And uh, he actually said the exact same thing. There was a, a question from the audience, uh, which is, what's the one thing that you know, you would give us advice with, and it was uh, to be open to these experiences. You know, we get all kinds of language. Get outside your comfort zone, force yourself to do that, be open to different perspectives and, and so forth. Um, so I, I, I would say uh, one and a half things, because they're related. Um, so the, the ability to learn and evolve uh, is critically important. Um, I had the privilege of interviewing Charlie Munger not that long ago in Los Angeles, uh, and you can see it, it's on YouTube. It was a University of Michigan alumni event. And this is a gentleman who just turned 94 years old, uh, reads multiple books per week, right? Has essentially reinvented himself as an investor many times over. Uh, and so there's this deep commitment to learning and personal growth and, and, uh, and basically uh, arguing as if he's right, but listening as if he's wrong which I think is a pretty important skill uh, for, for all of us to, to take. And my half, which is related to that, right? So argue as if I'm right, but listen as if I'm wrong. In order to really capture the value of diversity, diversity is about who's in the room. Inclusion is what happens when they're in the room, right? And it's one thing to have a diverse group of people in, in a room. It's another thing for that diversity to come together in a way that creates uh, and innovates and, and brings new ideas to life. And one thing that, I, that saddens me is, is the, the lack of respect that we now, as a society, globally, I think, have for people with different ideas, different beliefs, uh, different opinions than our own. Uh, I don't think we're doing enough listening as if we're wrong. Uh, and if I was going to provide any single piece of advice, it would be stay open to that learning uh, and, and, and listen as if you're wrong, because we, none of us, are perfect and know everything. And if we had a little more respect uh, for differing opinions in our society, the world would probably be a little bit better place. Thank you so much to both of you for being here. A round of applause for you. Really appreciate hearing your perspectives today. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Andrea, I think you had some you. words for us. Is this on? Yes. Thank you so much for the conversation today. I feel like, for me, uh, it's very gratifying to have a conversation with workplace, Airbnb, alumni who are doing things all over the Bay Area that are different, and to thought leaders who are thinking in the space of technology and the soft skills of leadership. With today's world, political climate, it's so nice to have hope in how we think about the messy place we're in, which is, which is constantly changing. And the message that I'm coming away with is that's to what we all have to do for ourselves, just learn to adapt and evolve and learn and listen. So thank you for letting us learn from you tonight. Um, I am not unaware that there's a little game going on in a few minutes here. Uh, so I'm, I'm here to help you understand what's happening next. <laughs> we are how many minutes away from tip-off? I think 10. These screens are turning into the game soon. Um, and for those of you who are staying, we hope you will, uh, we're going to have a little reception afterwards, the drink wall, appetizers are still open. And uh, if you have follow-up questions with the deans, I think you guys will stick around for a few more minutes. You're welcome to stay for the game. 
Uh, dinner is opening up, and for those of you who are here as guests, you're welcome to hot dinner, join us for the game, and go blue. Go blue. Go blue. Thank you. I, I forgot one, one other thing. I was told to step into the late, not into the dark. Um, I want to thank uh, James Devaney and the Office of Academic Innovation at U of M. Uh, he helped co-host this event with us and bring the deans, as well as the Alumni Association. So Shelly, thank you, who's in the audience. Thank you. And Kate, thanks for hosting. All right, let's get the party started. <laughs>